interesting. That way, for anyone watching the replay, we'll kind of expect that there's a process too. Got it. Should I start the webinar? Okay, stand by. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hit start webinar when we go to the. Or should we just go ahead and start it now? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Let's get this started. Okay, we should be live, Tim. So is can that you it? See me? Can you hear me? I That's don't know. Our <laughs> webinar process. We just started it like that. I think so. So for um, I do see a handful of participants already here. So we will get started in just a minute or two. Tim, say hello and greetings from New York. I already miss you. Hello and greetings from well, I'm in Oregon, but greetings to New York, I guess specifically. Uh, it was really right. great to be out there. I, you know, I, I had been traveling as you had um, for many weeks, um, but to get back to New York in the spring, absolutely loved it. The NFT conference, you know, there's a lot happening in that space. Um, and Emma and I covered that in our, our podcast, but obviously the time just to finally make some content with you and to see some business owners face to face was really great. Yeah, by the way, um, I'll just mention this too, to uh, those of you that are dropping in, you may have been prompted to enter your name, email, et cetera, which is really in response to some security breaches we had uh, in the past. So we're trying to, again, be a little more buttoned up and uh, we're using the webinar mode here in, in Zoom. So we appreciate you bearing, bearing with us as we uh, run a tighter ship, right, Tim? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing when you get taken over by other people's videos. Um, yeah, you can you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, we're going to get started, what, in just about 30 seconds, maybe to a minute, because some people may be getting through the registration step. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, let's see, Tim, what else are we, I was going to say, is there anything else we needed to share before we dive into, like, why we're here today? I think that was it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. All right, we're um, we're two minutes past the hour, so I'm going to officially greet you and say welcome to this week's weekly briefing. I am Joel, and I am joined by my partner and friend Tim Thompson for this 30 minute sort of rapid fire thing we do every week, which is our moment to pause and say what's going on, right? What's the the hot topic? What are people talking about? What's new? What do you need to know? And Tim, there was something that happened. What was it? What day is this? Thursday? Was it last Friday, Monday that we were, you were here? And it you tell everybody what we were doing. Yeah, uh, starting last Friday, we did, we started the briefings with the business owners, um, which is, is like a fun moment, isn't it? We find ourselves at a location. We invite people to come join us. At the last minute, we had a couple openings. So people, a few uh, people just jumped in and kind of filled in the gaps for us. And you and I just sit down all day, drink coffee or whatever is being poured in front of us and talk about what's going on in the industry with face-to-face, 45-minute -face. Um, meetings, get through each one. Uh, and I love it because there's, you know, what we do at Rev Think is we're looking at patterns with all the clients that we work with. And we see that, we have some internal conversations and discussions of theories of what's happening, but to sit down face-to-face -face with business owners gives us a chance to ask, are they experiencing that? What other things are, are, is happening? And we get to listen. And of course, that strengthens our ability to pass on that information to the bigger community. So th that entire process, I absolutely love. And to do that Friday and then get, get, get on Monday with some one-on-one -on -one more, they're paying clients, but more intense um, processes with them. And we're going to do it again in just a, a few weeks and, or maybe a month, I guess, from now and, and when we get down to Los Angeles. So keep ourselves busy, Joel. Yeah, I think it was, <laughs> um, yeah. So for if you can connect with us in person, of course, we invite you to do that, because it is awesome to be face to face with people. Again, that feels amazing to see people in 3d in real life. But I will say the, um, as soon as we share with people, you know, here's what we've been sensing, here's some of the data we're seeing, people immediately say, well, tell me more, right? Like, tell me more what what are you seeing? Because they're looking at their numbers and some of their what they're feeling is shifting in the industry. And we can say, well, we're looking at maybe 20 or 30 companies and, and aggregating that data. And 
everyone, it was interesting because everyone had some level of acknowledgement of, yeah, things are, something's different, right? Like certain things are now being put on pause or this got postponed or this thing we were counting on, this contract actually did get revoked or there's those little anecdotes, right, Tim? And, and it was maybe a month ago that we as a team uh, inside RevThink, we were having our weekly meeting and I was saying, hey, has anyone noticed this? And someone else said, yeah, wait, I was gonna ask you about that. And that's when we started paying attention to this. And now, I don't know if we're like officially raising a red flag, but we're just starting to say, hey, we sense changes are happening. And now we're starting to say, what should people be doing about it? Yeah, the reason why it feels unofficial, isn't it? Where is that the word that we're hearing more often is pause. So a client put this project on pause, which is very different than the client canceled the project or I can't find any projects. In other words, the experience business owners are having is that they've been awarded a project or about to be awarded a project and the client is wait, saying, hold on a second, we have, to, we have to have an internal conversation. And I think that's a very, it's probably a very early indicator that something's happening because it's clearly happening on a scale. Um, my theory right. is, is that these corporations are kind of saying, hey, the economy, we have some official numbers with the economy and we'd be crazy not to ask questions first before we say absolutely go with this project. So they're saying, let me just pause for one second. I mean, you just go rebudget this or rethink this before we green line it. And it does seem like it's happening, but there is a, a disruption to the normal pattern that we're used to. Yeah, I, and I'm going to say this, from my years of being an owner, I hate that word pause, right? Like entrepreneurs, like we, we love yeses. We don't like no's, but I'll take a no any day over a maybe. And I, over the years, started translating the word pause as canceled. So I don't, maybe that's just my personal opinion, but in terms of how I forecast projects and cash flow, to me, pause is canceled. So take that for what it's worth. So uh, Tim, what do we want to share with people? Because we're talking about this idea, right? Hang on, I'm going to share my screen. Because the, the title for today's session is Shock Absorbers for Your Studio, Thriving Despite the Slowing Economy. Give us like the overall big idea. Why, why did we choose this title? Yeah, because we're, again, when you get an indication that something's about ready to hit, right? There's like going to be a dip in the road. You want to have a sense of working through it proactively. How do we understand what's coming up and what can we do to prepare for it? That way, when you hit that bump, you have a shock absorber. You are holding on tighter or letting things go or actually built a spring into your system. Um, it's interesting, Jed just uh, sent a message here too and saying that it's interesting we're talking about this because he's experiencing a greater sales volume than he's used to, even greater than last year already. And I, right. I love that this is a, is a kickoff point for some of this discussion because what we're not saying, and again, like why we're not, you know, holding up a white flag or screaming from a mountaintop that everything's broken, is that we have experienced for the last year or two years, some amazing growth. And I think there's a lot of indicators there to say, oh, wow, there's the economy has, is in our favor um, or has been in favor for, for a little while. I guess the question we're see, asking and the pattern we're seeing is that because the economy has been so good for a good enough amount of time, a year and a half, two years, we've gotten into one pattern and we're asking a question, but what if a pattern shift is happening? And we're not talking about loss or competition. We're talking about the, the rate at which you're getting projects awarded to you. And that shifting of that pattern changes things, your cash flow, your expense items and so on. And that disruption creates a, a kind of a different kind of chaos for you. So I'm gonna share my screen because we, Tim and I did a little bit of homework to try and help <laughs> to make it visual, right? Creative people were visual people. And this was, this was our attempt at trying to ask that question, right? Tim, what you were saying about pattern interruption. So let's take a look at this. Let's say these are projects on the vertical and now there's time at the bottom, present, projected, future. So this orange line here, we're going to call this, what, your cash? Mm. This is really, like when you project your cash, of course, it's always going down. You're running out of money after a couple months. That's pretty common. But then what we know is 
when that time actually plays out, this is what usually happens. Like other projects come in, maybe you get more money, you get overages and it kind of levels out and, and there you go. And this is what those projects look like as they play out over time, right? So now what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna Tim, I'm gonna hand it to you because now we're seeing something more like this. So what are we seeing here in projected? Yeah, so think of the, the first slide as being something that kind of establishes that expectation for you. And now we're asking a question if what's projected in the short term are these kind of disruptions or you know maybe even just a small hiccup or a bigger disruption. But what's happening is you can see the pattern is changing and it's the project size might be the same, but you might um, be awarded two weeks later, three weeks later. And that little extension to your sales cycle now offsets your revenue cycle. And then other projects might come in and there might be another like slight dis disruption. So when we see clients behaving differently like this, what we're recognizing is, is that things are gonna be out of pattern. And if I were to put that on a cash flow sheet, what I'd realize is I have a constant cost running across my company and my revenue goes up and down, as we've pointed out here. You know, projects come in, projects, um, bigger ones, small ones, but I kind of build an average to cover my burn rate. But, and again, the total revenue might look the same, but if the rate at which that revenue comes in changes, what happens to revenue is it starts taking these weird dips and my expenses remain the same. And all of a sudden now I'm gonna have cash issues. Um, one of my biggest concerns yeah. is that we're actually recognizing something and we actually can't see it because current accounts receivable in your business is covering up this pattern. You're, the clients are delivering projects or kind of putting projects out at different rates, but my current flow of cash matches the way they used to hand out projects. And so if I'm looking at eight week or even a 12 week cash flow, I might not see this, but pretty soon, 12 weeks out, there's no projects awarded, 11 weeks out, 10 weeks out, all of a sudden there's a kind of a gap and then something's awarded and we go, okay, cool, it's just a little hiccup. But if that happens two or three times, now you get these cash crashes um, and your business is gonna be interrupted. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of um, one owner we met with that was, let's just say it's in that six to 7 million range and was sort of saying, well, yeah, there's this, Hiccup, we'll call it, if I'm using your term, Tim, this hiccup. But when things sort of stabilize, it'll look like to over here on the right. It'll be kind of like back to normal, aka back to normal. And the question we were asking was, well, if before the pandemic, if you were a $4 million company, maybe you're still a $4 million a year company that had a 6 to $7 million a year. And I think that's a really simple way to put it, like what's the right sizing of that type of company in if this pattern is being disrupted. So Tim, I'm going to show like, here's the future, right? Big question mark. Yeah. So because we, right, you're biased. To say, yeah. You're biased to say, well, it will get back means you're looking at the pattern that we have in the present, hoping that, you know, it's just a disruption and then it goes back to normal. And we're kind of saying, well, yeah, but what we asked the question of this pattern change actually leads to a different future pattern as well. So we have the pattern we're used to, we're currently in, the pattern we're projected, and then it might become regular, but things might be different. Smaller projects, different return rates, longer sales cycles, things that you don't have a lot of control over, but can be a reality to um, getting projects in and of course, keeping up with your costs. So we don't like to entertain this what if, at least I don't, when I was, an owner, but I do know this from experience because I got caught a couple times. This is the exposure, right? The, 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 the delta between that business as usual and that exposure can be, you know, for me, it was many hundreds of thousands of dollars in just a few months. So again, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm Tim, like you, I'm not saying that the sky is falling and that we're heading towards this red line. I'm just saying, if that were to happen, how can owners be prepared? How do we right size? How do we dynamically manage costs and so forth? So what do you say? Sure. So obviously what we're talking about here is something that affects your cash position. So cash is king and we have to make different decisions around the cash we have. What's interesting is, is 
and many of you are feeling that things are going well right now, then you might be hearing this slight hint that something's going to change. Well, when things are going well, this is the time to capture cash. So in this really weird way, you might have to start behaving as if you don't have any cash, even though you do, so that you can start creating that reserve that you'll need as this disruption comes through. Now, you don't have to do it right away if you're looking at a, a clear cash board, things look the same for, for the next 12 uh, weeks, great. That means in your bidding process, in your sales process and landing projects, ask different questions, um, understand what's different. And then Joel, if you go to that, that last point that the slide made there, because another reality is that these costs due to inflation are also increasing. So I might not even be feeling the crunch of those costs now, but if they slowly increase over time, that means at some point in the future, this resource is gonna cost me more money. If I wait until it costs me money, then I didn't ask the client for th that money when I needed it. So you, being proactive, you have to say to the, or start working on your bids and saying, I better start asking for higher rates sooner than when I actually have to spend that. Um, otherwise you'll end up upside down on projects and it gets kind of crunchy and you wanna, you wanna avoid that exposure. Yeah, I'm thinking of, um, there were a few owners we talked with that do these long-term projects. And by long-term, I, I only mean a few months, right? Rather than a few weeks. But we were even asking that question, have you considered changing the splits midstream, right? Like, oh, this project, right? We're, we're flush with cash. The splits on that project are 70-30. Like we're giving 70% of the money back to the client. And we were just asking the question, well, you could change that. You could just basically say, we got to finish the project and then the splits are 50-50. Again, it's just an interesting question to ask. Could you, what would that look like? Is that too extreme, right? Would the team be stressed out? Would the client even notice? Because again, the creative product that we're all producing, whether it's a commercial and animation, it's very subjective. We have an enormous latitude. So what other, what, are, what, what other thoughts do you have, Tim? Like your, like your rug pull that we talked about on the podcast yeah. the other day. You can, um, no, you're exactly right. If once you recognize and our encouragement is to get yourself in a place that you have control over these elements, right? So the fact that if you're running a roll up and you're using the splits, there is a moment even mid project that you can shift things and you can see the results of, of that effort um, being played out. That's an absolute positive position to be in because you, if you're hoping that this isn't true and then it becomes true, but you don't have any control over the business decisions to make a difference, then you really are just being pulled into a vortex that you're and you can't get out. It's, it's very difficult to figure that out. But if you're looking ahead and controlling that in a very proactive way, then you can start asking new questions of, well, do I have to actually, you know, deliver all these elements as um, we're currently planning or does scope actually allow me to pull back, make some changes and actually hold in onto some cash now so that I'm stronger um, when this disruption plays out in my company. Um, cash flow is also a place you can ask those questions. As you're saying, there's opportunity to recognize that clients owe you money at a certain pace. And if projects are not going well, there's opportunities to kind of work with your client, correct things sooner than later. And at worst, worst case scenario, even recognize there's a termination clause in your contract so that maybe this is the moment you actually might have to use that button, that escape patch button with your client because you don't wanna be risking cash when you might need it in the near future. I'm laughing because when you, a moment ago you said the word hope, I, in ringing in my ears was something my friend Cherish taught me many years ago that hope is not a plan, Joel. Hope is not a plan. <laughs> and, and it's it's true, right? Um, I'm thinking too for, um, by the way, we should open it up, of course, if you have questions or comments, please hit, hit us up in the chat here um, or in the Q&A. We're always, of course, happy to get those and process them, those as we go along in real time. So Tim, just something that's worth mentioning because for people, owners here that are asking, okay, so what would I actually do about this, right? Put it in really practical terms. We did talk about this on the podcast. I don't know when it's going live. Maybe Lydia can give us a sense. I think it'll be out maybe next week or the week following, but we talk about these two sides of the coin. Like if the coin is called disruption and maybe it's slow down, maybe it's not, okay? 
We don't know. There's just that question mark. So let's just call it that. It's disruption. What would we do? Now, my favorite side of the coin is positioning and marketing and sales. Okay. And I've said those in that, that order because there was somebody we met with in New York. And I loved what you pointed out, Tim. You were like, I'm so glad you guys finished the positioning. You're so like, your message is so clear. Your website and your point of view is so on point. You're out there, you're spreading the message, you're doing that marketing thing. So now you're ready to sell. So you can actually just pick up the phone and start making calls and people say, yeah, I know who you are. I know what you're about. I'm interested, let's talk. As opposed to the person who, if there was a slowdown, thinks, oh, I'll just start making a bunch of phone calls. And what they hear on the other end of the phone, again, I use the word phone in the, in the old sense of the word, but what they would hear on the other receiving end is, I don't really know who you are. I don't really know what you're about. And I don't really know why you're bothering me. Okay. Right. So don't be that, don't be that guy. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, well, production and finance. So that's, that's your, that's, it's your turn. Yeah. I mean, well said, well, you're, again, you're encouraging just recognizing how being proactive works and very difficult in a cycle when you're really, really busy. It's almost this thought of like, one, why do I need it? I'm super busy right now. And two, I don't have the time and space to be thinking about solving a problem I don't yet have. Right. So very true, very real. I'm a business owner myself and I, I understand that, but there are things that you can do very easily, like start asking yourself positioning questions, uh, understanding what the market trend is and listen to your current clients without a lot of effort. You can start understanding where you're going to be, what your pivot is and how you're going to position yourself in a marketplace. You know, Matt, uh, Matthew Packwood asked the question, do we have any ideas of how grow, how, how you should grow in a slowing market? And it really mm -hmm. fits with what you're saying, Joel, you know, in a market that slows down, your clients are also asking that same question. What should we do different? now that our clients or our customers are buying our product differently. Um, right. And that change of their need creates an opportunity for you too. What I know is those major brands still need customers. So they're still gonna buy commercial space. They're gonna need people to convert to their product and they need you, you and your ability to make that happen, but they might change how they message or might change directly who they reach out to. And they might even change some of the technology. So they might spend in one type of market buy different than other market buy. Those are all really amazing questions to understand now so that when those pivots are taking place, you're seen as the expert. You've put yourself out there as expert. And you've said that before that client's asking, because when they start Googling, who can fix this for me? You have to have that posted on your website. Um, you know, you <clears> often <throat> use that language of, your buyer, your client is either in a preservation mindset or a promotion mindset. And I was just thinking about how we might be entering a season where they're in a preservation mindset. And so your offering may need to shift from one of, I'm gonna grow your numbers or your volume to one of, no, I'm gonna mature and grow your, your, your offering to give you some sense of security that you're not gonna lose what you have. So maybe it's just an, a different way of, engaging with your clients where you're asking questions less about how can we keep this trend going because that's not where it's going. But if, if this is the trend, how do I help you best? How do I engage with you? What, do you? what are your new problems that can help you preserve what you've got and not lose, lose what you have? Yeah, and in a time of change, we, we did this with when we did Revolve um, early on in the pandemic, we recognized there's these paradoxes that are taking place and sometimes you are going to preserve by promoting. So you recognize, hey, the reason for me to get, the way for me to get ahead is to recognize everyone else is preserving. I better understand what it, how to put myself out there as much as possible as someone that can preserve your goods. And that's what clients wanna hear. Oh, you need safekeeping? Give me an opportunity. Everything will be safe for you. So you're promoting their preservation. That's a kind of an opportunity that you have there. Um, another question David asked, which is really the other side of the coin that you're talking about is from the financial side. What are things mm -hmm. you can do? David asked the question, should we be looking at increasing our rates because of inflation and the result of it? The, the, the question of that is yes. And here's the best opportunity you have, right? Don't let any good crisis go to waste. The fact that the world is talking about inflation gives you a chance to raise your rates. Can you imagine how much more difficult it would be to raise your rates when there's not inflation? 
right? You're basically just opening yourself up for a negotiating you're not going to win. But today, if someone asks you, why did you raise your rates? You have one simple answer, inflation. So this yeah. is the moment that you should do it, absolutely. But there's an opportunity you have to do it. And why would you wait any longer to do it? You don't have to see the absolute results of it before you'll feel and understand the results of it. I'm also gonna say this, because we preach this a lot, right? Rates are an internal thing, right? An internal discussion. I don't, like David, I don't want you discussing rates with your clients. So what's actually happening is when you find out the number and your client says, right, we have 50,000 to do this job. If you're raising your rates, that's an internal decision. Really what the decision you're making is, can I do the job a little faster? That's really what you're deciding. You're saying, can I be a little bit more efficient? Can I be a little bit more clever and get this, the job done for the same number, but a little bit faster? And that's effectively increasing your rates. So you might just think of it that way. How can I do the job a little bit smarter, a little bit more shrewdly, perhaps even a do I even dare use the word a little bit more greedy, Tim? Yeah, it's not. I know it feels like greed. It looks like greed and it smells like greed. But I just think it's being shrewd, to be honest. Like it's yeah. it's running oh. a business and knowing that my future costs will increase. Therefore, I need revenue today to cover those future costs. You can't wait till after the, after the time you need it. Right. Because your first job in business is to stay in business. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. It's always your first job. All right, here's a good question or comment. Arturo uh, said it's hard knowing when to hire a permanent position when you don't know how long you have that amount of revenue coming in. And I think our encouragement um, on that type of a situation is one, make sure you do have a cash flow that looks out 12 weeks. So you're making decisions about when, okay, not just decisions about what. Uh, and then I think the other encouragement too is it's actually okay to hire somebody as long as you've done your due diligence, if in three months it doesn't work out, it's it's actually okay. You did your best by that person. If it doesn't work out, hey, I've got to convert you back to freelance or part-time or contract or something. I, do, I feel like so many owners feel such an obligation and I get it, I was there and I respect it, but we feel such a sense of, I have to employ this person for years and years, hopefully forever, or else I'm a bad person. Yeah, when you're bringing on um, employees that you know you're going to get a return on investment from, it's always a good time to bring them on. Always a good time because you're going to look at growth or profit because of that position. So that's one decision that's easy to make. But I also get the idea like you want this understanding that the future is going to solve this problem for you or and that you're supposed to already know the future. To me, I'd say like, don't don't expect that. Like what you the promise is, is that the future will come Right now, you can choose which problem you're going to solve, like hiring a person and trying to keep them employed is a choice you can make. But no matter what, there will be problems in the future that you're going to have to solve that you aren't anticipating. And you'll even get through those problems. And that's the promise you make to yourself. Whatever the problems are, I can solve it. Why not make ones to help me grow my business? So did you happen to read Laura's question here? I'm just starting to scan it. Yeah, she has this idea of she, the question her, she has is, so what if you're halfway through a project and you're recognizing your costs are increasing? At what point do you address that with the client? Do you have to just eat it? Or can you change the costs? So one thing you can do very much um, or very well with a client is give them insight to what's happening with you. Not full Monty kind of insight, but the thought, <laughs> full Monty, where'd that pop in my brain? Holy cow, man, <laughs> nice that just reference. came out of nowhere. <laughs> I mean, hanging out with the Scottish guys too last week. It works. Yeah, but you don't have to give full exposure to what's going on. The thought there is, is like you can come alongside your client and they can come alongside you and recognize where you stand on the project. So if you're working through a project and you're realizing, hey, my the, the budget is running out and I have a lot of costs remaining, you can work with your client and tell them, hey, um, we should discuss delivery. We should discuss the schedule that's coming up and how the new decisions we're making or how this now this project is playing out, how this decision we made to play out this project is affecting our budget and our schedule. Always put those two together. Um, so one thing you wanna do is say like, can I adjust the schedule to meet the current demands? Because that will often give, give your client an understanding of what you're up against and it manages their expectations. They're not gonna expect as much in two days as they would expect in two months. 
So schedule is one area you can discuss and pivot and change without getting down to the nitty gritty of cost. But other things you can point out to them directly. Hey, when you made that choice, it's causing these overages and I have to charge you more. So you're going to get an overage for that. And you start working with them and managing their expectations there. Yeah, there's a mindset here, Tim, that I want to call out in case it's in play. So Laura, one thing I'm wondering is a lot of times the business owner thinks, oh, well, if my costs increase, I have to go to the client and get more money. But remember, a price is never really based on your costs. I know I just, somebody, somebody out there just went, what? Because the old way was we add up all of our costs, we add a margin and there's a price. Okay, but instead we price the client, how much money do you have? I'll give you the best solution within that number. And then how we execute that is our genius. That's our entrepreneurial genius at work. So the reason I say that is I would caution you because I've had clients say to me in so many words, hey, don't make your problem my problem. So my first thought is if your costs are increasing, you have to be, guess what, creative. Ask yourself, hey, there's subjectivity in these deliverables. How can I get with my team? And even though our costs are increasing, like Tim said, through schedule, through resources, through changing the creative, right? Instead of rendering this way, we're going to render that way, right? Get creative. Still, if you sense this isn't going to get us there, then yes. Then there's that moment to say, I see what's coming and I'm going to be proactive and let my client know we've been changing and adjusting and adapting, but we have some realities that are unfortunately just insurmountable. So let's talk about deliverably sorry, deliverables, let's talk about the creative, let's talk about all these levers that we can pull on so that you don't have an overage. But if that's not acceptable to you, then let's talk about an overage because we're happy to increase the amount of money we're charging you to give you what it is, you know, that solves your problem. And we, we actually discussed this in full in the producer masterclass we did. It's the estimated future costs part of it. And when you're working on a project and you're doing those estimated future costs, you're gonna see this sooner than you actually have the crisis much like we talked about corporate wide. And that gives you a chance to manage that client's expectations, introduce the idea sooner, be more proactive in the process and, and therefore a little bit more friendly when you're addressing it. So I think, unfortunately, we do need to wrap it up because we are two minutes past our allotted 30 minutes. These are good questions. Tim, good questions are coming in. Yeah, these are really great questions. <laughs> I, I'm super appreciative. Um, Tim, by the way, tomorrow, our next Jumpstart kicks off and I'm super excited because we got a batch of Brave owners who are going to subject themselves to the proverbial drinking from the fire hose and positioning and all that that happens over the next six weeks. So please give them a round of applause for stepping Absolutely. into the fire. Good for you all. And one week from yesterday, we're also launching Revolve. If you are interested in understanding the principles about RevThink, the, the seven ingredients, the seasons of a creative firm, uh, positioning and um, the splits. It's a great crash course. Just understand what's going on in RevThink. How do you understand and how do you th think the way you need to as a business owner? So Revolve will start next week. It's open to um, everyone in our community. So if you're not a community member, please jump in. If you are interested, please reach out to us. We'll give you the information of how to sign up for Revolve. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is the weekly briefing. I forgot to date stamp it. It is Thursday, June the 30th, 2022. All right. Thanks, Tim. Of course. Later, Joel. Bye, everyone.